our future meeting. And more for more information, please uh, visit our future meeting page on the ABS website. Uh, we are also accepting the applications for the 2021 class of fellows of the ABS. Um, so if you've been a member for a, a minimum of 15 years with 10 or more years of significant service of the ABS, uh, whether it's at the board level, committee, working group task force, or any organization level, please apply. We would love to have you as a fellow of our society. Uh, also, I just want to remind you about uh, your membership. It's uh, expired December 31st, 2020. Um, and uh, you are now within a, your membership grace uh, period. Uh, it has been a strange year for all of us. I know that is the last thing you will want to do is uh, renew uh, uh, membership, but uh, we have gone virtual and we hope uh, that with these uh, kind of uh, information and education uh, uh, activities such as this one, uh, hope you find value in this. And also in 2021, we plan to uh, provide more programs um, with more tools on the website. I hope you'll join me with our journey to make an impact in the field of Reiki therapy. There is strength in numbers and our voices are heard when we speak uh, in uh, unison. So uh, uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our uh, speakers. Uh, uh, first, uh, let me remind you, this is the goal of this webinar is to discuss the benefits of MRR for HDR Reiki therapy. So we focus on HDR, uh, be aware of published resources. We will uh, summarize those and understand practical considerations that arise when incorporating MRI into GYN and prostate Reiki therapy uh, programs. Um, with that, uh, we have uh, uh, two distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Jacqueline uh, Zubiri. She is the uh, professor of radiation oncology and the chief of brachytherapy medical physics services in the Department of Radiation Oncology in Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Uh, I've known um, Jackie for many, many years. We've, gi we've given a lot of uh, uh, presentations together through AAPM activity on brachytherapy. And the uh, second sp speaker is uh, Gil Cohen. Everybody should probably know him. He is the co-chair of the ABS Physics Committee, as well as, of course, he is a very active brachytherapist in the Department of Medical Physics at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, New York. The two excellent uh, speakers, Jackie will focus on GYN uh, and Gil will talk about prostate. Of course, there's a lot of some overlaps between the two. So some of it will not be, uh, uh, we, try, we try to make a program that's not uh, uh, too overly redundant, but there are some experiences that are unique for both. So with that, I'll turn it to Jackie. Also, I wanna remind you, by the way, that the chat box, please write your questions there. And at the end of the, the both uh, talks, we will address you at, as the time allows. Thank you. Jackie, it's yours. Great. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for that introduction for us. Um, I hope you all can hear me. If not for us, please let me know. Um, so I will be uh, focusing on the GYN brachytherapy portion of this talk um, in regards to implementation of MRI. Um, this is, these are just my disclosures. I do want to point out that I'm a member of AAPM Task Group 303, and I'm going to be making references to this task group, even though it is still pending review. Okay, so let's get started. Um, let's say your clinicians want to implement MR guidance for HDR, GYN, brachytherapy for cervix cancer. Well, as a, as a physicist, how do you respond? Where do you start? Um, well, I think the first step is to be very clear on how the team wants to implement MRI. Um, in my experience, I've heard the terms MR guidance or MR guided used to uh, refer to things that are actually not MR guided. So I think it's important to understand the different implementations for MRI. Uh, 
and they can be generally categorized as MR informed, MR based, and MR guided. So here's a, a description of MR informed HDR brachytherapy. It is probably the easiest um, of the implementations um, to start with in your clinic. It's where the MRI is acquired prior to implant. This might be a time of diagnosis as shown here in this workflow diagram, or it could be any time just before the implant. And these images can be reviewed um, you know, on a screen um, prior to the implant or during the implant for selection and placement of applicators. It can also be um, a data set that's imported into your planning system and registered to a planning CT. And this is helpful for target delineation. Um, the disadvantage of this approach, even though it's pretty easy, I would say, to implement, or the easiest, um, is to be aware of deformations that can occur because obviously these images are acquired at different time points and one of your images now has an applicator in it. For MR-based brachytherapy, the next implementation, this is probably the most common approach and it's often confused with MR-guided. Um, there are different implementations for MR-based. Um, the first one being you have an MRI-only approach where the MRI, um, an MRI sim is done following the implant and those MR images are used for planning as shown in this workflow here. There's also a hybrid approach where an MRI and a CT can be acquired of the implant, but planning is reserved on the, the CT. The MRI only approach for every fraction would be considered the ideal MR based approach. However, it's pretty resource intense to acquire an MRI for every fraction. So as an alternative, the hybrid approach may be utilized um, when MRI access is limited. So an example of an MR based hybrid approach would be um, your clinic may acquire an MRI early on during the brachytherapy process, for example, let's say first fraction. And then a CT might be acquired for the remaining fractions and that's registered back to that first fraction MRI. And the MRI would be used for target delineation and the CT would be for applicator reconstruction and to define those organs at risk and it would be your primary data set. So the advantages is that your applicator can be easier to visualize and more accurate to reconstruct on the CT. The disadvantage is that the registration between this um, first fraction MRI and these following CTs can be challenging. Um, the third implementation is MR guided brachytherapy. It's the least common um, because it's just less available. Um, it would involve applicator insertion that is guided intraoperatively in the MRI suite. So basically images are acquired during the implant and those images are used to guide uh, the placement of uh, the applicator, the needles. Here I've got a bunch of different approaches for MR guidance, but the bottom line is that it's uh, resource intensive. It requires access to that MRI unit with trained operators for a pretty significant amount of time. And it also involves additional um, MRI safe uh, equipment. In addition to those applicators, you're gonna have to have uh, MRI safe anesthesia equipment, stretchers, et cetera. So let's say now that you have an understanding of these different approaches, it's up to the, your institution to assess um, their infrastructure, their personnel to determine the best workflow to implement. And it could even be some hybrid implementation. It could be a combination of uh, MR based along with MR informed. That's what we do in our clinic. Um, so let's say the goal of your clinic is to implement MR based HDR GYN, cervix cancer brachy, with MRI for every fraction. So given that goal, the, object, the objectives of this presentation are the following, to understand the benefits of having this MR-based program, to be aware of the resources that are available and coming, and to understand the practical considerations that will arise when you're in incorporating MRI into your brachy process. So with the first of these, the benefits of an MR-based program, well, the first benefit is that you're, you're, you're now working with 3D um, imaging, um, opposed to the, the, uh, the old days of 2D film-based. And this is an advantage because now you can assess the tumor geometry 
in addition to the applicator geometry, because you should be able to see it better, um, you can assess dose to the tumor as well as the organs at risk from external beam as well as brachy. And this is done using summation of dose volume metrics and these dose trackers. Here's an example of a dose tracker. Um, and you can use this information to adapt your dose during treatment. And this leads to a very powerful tool of image guided adaptive brachytherapy. And of course, you can also use these um, images to assess tumor response. So with these benefits, improved outcomes have been observed. And this has been reported by Retro Embrace, um, which was a retrospective review of more than 700 patients treated at several centers that had this experience with Jack Estro um, recommendations. And they found that uh, image-guided adaptive brachytherapy combined with chemo led to excellent local control with limited severe morbidity at three years. <clears throat> and they also showed a trend for improved overall survival when compared to planning on 2D. And there is more data, more analysis underway with prospective studies, namely the EMBRACE um, protocols, which will involve more patients and more centers. Um, so the second objective was to be aware of published resource documents. And of course, there are the Jack Estro recommendations. And you know, we, we need to keep in mind that those recommendations were based on the experience of a, a handful of centers. But the good news is, is that this experience is increasing with Embrace. And there are more than 20 publications from Embrace with more guidance on, on all of those recommendations from Jack Estro, so that's wonderful. And then we also have ICRU 89, which is like the 3D equivalent of ICRU 38. And it's, it's a, a very comprehensive document that describes these image guided concepts and, and also provides some historical context. So it's kind of neat to read. Okay, so um, where do we start? So the goal is to implement MRI based brachytherapy. And if you have never done HDR brachytherapy in your clinic, what I would recommend is you start with um, uh, CT. So you learn about 3D planning on CT and you make that transition to MRI. And if you're a clinic that does do brachytherapy, but you are in the film-based um, um, phase of, of, of this process, I would recommend the same thing. This is my personal recommendation, transition to 3D via CT and then implement MRI because making that direct jump can be hard. Okay, so um, I call this a uh, pro tip because um, I think it's somewhat obvious, but I think a, a clinic should start by gaining experience with 3D planning on CT before they, they go to MRI. And this would involve all of these steps here, you know, what, what you would do in CT, you'd commission the CT sim process, the planning process, you'd uh, learn how to contour in 3D, how to define the applicator, how to do this isodose planning, DVH evaluation, dose tracking, dose adaptation. I mean, if you can see the target and you'll you know, have to do some basic things like ensure you have appropriate CT imager and SIMQA. And by doing this, by, by getting this experience, you've also set a baseline, a reference for when you are ready to start commissioning your applicators um, with MRI and commissioning this MR-based planning process. So after this, you should be better prepared to commission MRI-based planning. And during commissioning, you're gonna have some new considerations, um, but a lot of what you did on CT will carry over um, to MRI. Um, but the new considerations are, you need to think about your workflow, expand your team. Now you gotta commission this MR simulation process and that can be pretty intense, but at least now you have CT as a reference. Um, you're going to have to think about safety measures as well. So that's going to be new. Um, commissioning the MR planning process should be pretty similar to what you've already done on CT. And of course, you'll have to now establish that imager and SIMQA now for the MRI unit. And when you're ready to treat patients um, using MR images, I'd recommend you do CT and MR in parallel for the first several cases. It's going to be timely, it's gonna add some time, but you're learning. And eventually you'll transition to MRI only. 
And it's these items um, that are discussed or will be discussed, sorry, in TG303. And it's these items that I'm gonna focus on further here. So let's talk about the first one, which is thinking about your workflow. And you need to consider your options. For example, a big option uh, to consider is how, how, how much access does your clinic have to an MRI scanner? So if you wanted to do an MRI-based approach, um, the ideal again is an MR only, but if you don't have easy access to a scanner, then maybe you're gonna have to resort to that MRCT hybrid approach um, if it's appropriate for your clinic. You'll have to expand and prepare your team, of course. Um, and luckily in Bracky, you know, we're so used to working with multidisciplinary teams and that's, that's what you're gonna need here. You're gonna need staffing um, based on MR expertise. You're gonna need an MR radiologist, at least initially, um, an MRI physicist and an MRI technologist. And, and these two might be more um, long-term members of your team. And these folks will help you think about your workflow options, implement safety processes, um, and also commission those scanning protocols. And I list a bunch of pro tips here based on our experience. Um, so pro tip, CT SIM therapists cannot substitute for an MR technologist and vice versa. And same goes for your MR physicist and your radon brachy physicist. They're not interchangeable. Um, with some cross training, of course, you can get some multidisciplinary coverage. For example, in our SIM, our MR SIM, we have our SIM CT therapist assist our MR technologist. And your, your BRACI team members are now gonna have to have some additional training. If they want access to that MRI suite, they're gonna have to now start some general um, MR safety in addition to the, you know, the Alera trainings. Um, commissioning the MR brachytherapy SIM process. Well, first you're gonna have to acquire and commission some equipment, that MRI unit, the MR compatible applicators. You're gonna to have to design patient preparation procedures, develop imaging sequences, and you really need to ensure that safety is addressed throughout all of these steps. So for the first one, acquiring your um, MRI unit, um, perhaps what you get is a diagnostic scanner. Um, and this might be within your department or outside of your department in our case, we basically inherited a scanner that was no longer needed by cardiology. So we took the scanner. Um, it was a 1.5 Tesla unit. It was not radiation oncology designated. So we had to add a flat tabletop and some lasers to make it run on friendly. Um, option two would be you, you do have, um, or you do acquire a radiation oncology specific MR simulator. And this is actually what we got six years um, later after inheriting that old scanner. And that, that was quite nice. We stuck with the 1.5 Tesla. We got a bigger bore. We got the flat tabletop and the lasers. They came standard with the system. And we also got some metal artifact reduction software. So it was a pretty nice upgrade. Um, we had to think about patient preparation procedures. And so, you know, one of the first things you'll have to think about is developing an MRI screening questionnaire. I just have a snippet of one shown here. It's much longer than this. You'll have to develop a screening process. Um, how often do you want to screen the patient? It should be multiple times um, throughout the procedure. Um, you have to think about clothing the patients are gonna wear, how to prepare them for the scan because you're trying not to just get uh, good quality images for planning. You're also trying to be sure they're safe. Okay, oops, sorry. And same consideration, sorry, goes for positioning your patients. You wanna ensure safety as well as uh, get good quality images. Okay, so for the Brachy Therapy MR imaging sequence development, this is going to uh, require a bit of time and you're definitely gonna need some help with an M from an MRI physicist. Um, of course, you've gotta make sure there's a good QA program for that scanner in place, even if it's outside of your department. Um, the good news is you're not starting from scratch here. You've got some recommendations from Jack Estro um, and they highly recommend the T2 weighted MRI sequences. In fact, they consider them the golden standard for visualization of tumor and organs at risk with complementary sequences considered optional. And I wish I could say that's all there is to it. T2 weighted, you're done. But unfortunately it's not that easy because you're also imaging an applicator. 
and you may find that complementary sequences are required. And while, you know, Jack Estro gives you a pretty good um, uh, starting point, you're going to have to dig deeper into the literature if you want to figure out how to commission these applicators for MRI. And luckily, there are some papers um, out there. And, what, you know, they, they usually state you need, you need a QA phantom. You need something to fix your applicator in some tissue equivalent material. You want to image this phantom on CT. Like here, we've got a a tandem and ring, a plastic tandem and ring and a phantom that's been imaged on CT to serve as your reference images. And then it's gonna be imaged on MRI for sequence development. And what you're gonna do is evaluate these applicators and how you can visualize them and how good these images are for reconstruction um, on these MRI um, images. Um, and you're not just done. You need to continue this evaluation in clinical scans. And you may find that you need to further tweak these parameters. And so like here, for example, we have a plastic tandem and ring that's um, imaged on a T1 weighted sequence. And here it is in the patient. And you can see, hey, the applicator shows up pretty nicely. But unfortunately, we've lost um, the contrast between our target and the, and the surrounding tissues. So if we look at the same um, applicator um, and patient now on a different sequence, a T2-weighted MRI, we regain that target tissue contrast, but unfortunately, it's now harder to see the applicator. So um, what, may, what may be a sequence that's ideal for the applicator may not be ideal for the target and tissues and vice versa. So you may need multiple sequences is the bottom line to tell the whole story here. And you know, commissioning the applicators for MRI, this is a great way for the brachiophysicist to learn about the distortions and the artifacts, especially for titanium applicators. Um, the level of distortions and general image artifacts, they should be validated for <clears throat> specific conditions, excuse me, including applicator material. Is it plastic? Is it titanium? What's the Tesla strength? Um, what coils are we using? What imaging sequence is it? So you gotta evaluate for these different conditions. And the goal is we want to minimize these geometric errors because in the end, we wanna minimize dosimetric uncertainties. So, you know, we've learned a lot um, since Jack Estro came out. And what, what we've learned is that perhaps a multi-sequence MRI is, technique is a good way to go. Um, some general tips, if you do go that route, is to minimize the number of sequences, keep the sequence time short, um, try to take advantage of respiratory triggering if you can to reduce motion artifact, use surface array coils around the pelvis. And, you know, in agreement with Jack Estro, T2-weighted MRI should remain that primary data set for adaptive planning, but it is useful to register it to some complementary sequences. And I have an example of one here. This is a proton density weighted MRI image for applicator definition. So these images are acquired in the uh, sagittal plane parallel to the tandem. So this is a reconstructed view of the tandem and the ovoids in a T2 weighted data set. Kind of hard to see, right? But if you look at that same uh, uh, slice, basically the reconstructed slice in, the, in a proton density weighted scan, you can see that applicator really pop out making it easier to see, visualize, and digitize. Um, and then, you know, if your vendor, your MR vendor provides some distortion corrections or software, try to see it and take advantage of that. Here's a proton density weighted MRI scan, the sagittal view, and here's the tandem. And this is pretty common. You'll see a blooming of the, the tandem at the tip. And here it is after applying a metal artifact reduction sequence um, or correction, sorry, to the proton density weighted MRI sequence. And you can see now we've reduced that blooming and we've restored some of the anatomy um, beyond the tandem. So, um, you know, when you're commissioning these applicators for visualization and reconstruction accuracy, it's really important that you also consider safety tests. And this is something that's uh, really well addressed in task group 303 or will be. Um, the first recommendation is to just ensure that, or just check the instructions for use, the IFU, and just make sure prior to doing any scanning or um, even purchasing of that equipment, verify the, the, the device is labeled MRI conditional. You should see something like this. 
and verify the conditions under which it's tested. What's the field strength? What's the specific absorption rate? So keep in mind, you know, the RF in these MRI units is not ionizing, but they can cause heating. And that SAR, that is a, it's a measure of that energy deposition, which will, which will uh, lead to heating. So you really want to verify that that SAR is not exceeded for the different sequences. And keep in mind, multiple sequences mean um, that that SAR is accumulating. And that SAR that's reported on your MRI console, it's an estimate based on the patient's weight and the pulse sequence. So you still need to monitor your patient during the scan, just kind of check in and say, are you feeling okay? Are you feeling any discomfort? And keep in mind, titanium will lead to more heating um, and titanium needles in close proximity. Well, there's more localized heating at those tips. So if they're bunched up together, you could really bunch up that heating. And I've got a whole bunch of safety considerations here. I'm not gonna go over all of them, but here I'm just trying to make a point. It's not just for the applicators, for the entire procedure, you wanna make sure they're safe, that, that things are safe. So during that screening and prep process um, that I mentioned, keep in mind, this includes research. Yeah, you know, my MR technologist, she likes to call it research. She's researching all of these implanted objects that's in their patients. And if the manufacturer doesn't provide specs, she's gonna to go to the internet and look for information. Um, consider the use of plastic needles over titanium needles. You know, we're not tied to one over the other because of the vendor. We can, we can choose and plastic can lead to less artifacts and less heating. Um, if you're gonna transition to a higher Tesla unit in your clinic, like from 1.5 to three Tesla, just be sure to revalidate re the applicator commissioning at that higher Tesla, because you will have more heating as well as more susceptibility artifacts. So in summary, I hope I, I, I helped you get, have a better understanding of the benefits of having an MR-based program. There are improved clinical outcomes documented. Be aware of those published resources that are available in TG303, which is hopefully coming soon. Um, you also have your colleagues. And I hope you have an understanding, a better understanding of the practical considerations that arise um, when incorporating MRI into a GYN BRACI program. And my last slide, I just have a summary of what's coming in TG303, but I'm kind of going over time here. So I'm going to wrap it up and just say thank you to Faraz, the ABS, for inviting me to speak on this. And, um, oh, I'm hearing myself. <laughs> and I'd also like to thank my colleagues at work, especially our MR physicist, Mike Gatch, and Stacy Mackey. And that is it. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'm going to stop my share here. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I think let's turn it to uh, Jill to share his experience on the uh, uh, on the prostate. Um, and also, uh, I felt to say Jackie and uh, uh, Jill were members of, yeah. or still members of TG303. Hopefully, it will be coming soon. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, the, the question looks like it's, do you recommend performing monthly and annual QAs on the MRI units that may be in the diagnostic department? Okay, so that's, um, so I would certainly recommend it um, as to whether that can be enforced or not, because it's not actually your department's MRI. I don't, I don't know how well that might go over, but I would certainly recommend it. We, we, do, um, we do some level of daily QA just to make sure the MRI unit is working and images are transferring appropriately. Um, and I believe there is monthly and maybe quarterly QA as well. So we do that in our clinic. I would certainly recommend it for diagnostic, make a case for it as well. Thank you. Sure. We, we do the same thing. We don't uh, do the QA for the diagnostic. My, uh, mm -hmm. I, I do uh, have, when I commissioned the program, I saw that they do weekly uh, QA on the machine. It's all ACR. Uh, accredited so they were most of their QA seems uh, appropriate but uh, 
we have not uh, asked the breaking therapy physicists to uh, do the ex any additional uh, QA for the annual. Uh, we do uh, just check the commissioning of our applicators back into MR just to to check on it. So. I think maybe an, on an annual basis, as long as there is a program, if it's radiology with uh, some accreditation, they should have very, most of the QA you need done. Yeah, you know. that, that's a great point because if they already have appropriate QA processes in place, you might say that'll do. But for the annual QA, like we're, we do a treatment planning system, annual QA, and one of the things right. we do is we image an MRI uh, phantom in different orientations and send it to the scanner and just make sure that that's uh, working appropriately. At least that's done on an annual basis with regard to BRACI for MRI. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, my still an echo. No, no echo. Okay. Great. You sound great. Excellent. You can hear that. Great. All right. My, my apology for this. Um, so, um, so again, uh, th these are my, my disclosures. I uh, failed uh, to uh, mention I'm also a member of TG303, and I'm a liaison on TG267, which deals with the mobilization factors for MRI. Um, and some of, a lot of what's uh, mentioned there will uh, be mentioned. It will be part of this presentation as well. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of work being done, um, and I'm going to try to limit this to really uh, what I think is uh, worth mentioning and uh, to the issues that I've encountered when we implemented our MRI program for prostate brachytherapy. Um, and so we will talk a little bit about the advantages of the uh, MRI for prostate and uh, the uh, some of the challenges that we encountered and some issues that have to do with physics QA and commission. Um, and I, I will assume that uh, everyone who is uh, listening uh, has experience with HDR prostate brachytherapy. Uh, and so just to put this in context, we've uh, done this before with CT and with CT, it's readily available in our department. Uh, we have ex excellent visualization of the catheters and needles, whether plastic or metallic. Um, and, uh, but we do have some issues with CT regarding uncertainty in the prostate gland delineation, especially at the apex, at the base. Uh, we have no visualization of the internal structure of the prostate. Uh, we will definitely not see any DILs, uh, hardly be able to, uh, not be able to see any extra capsular ex extension. Um, we, uh, if we want to avoid the neurovascular bundles, we really cannot see those either. Um, and uh, w one of the other challenges that we have is that we implant our patients uh, using ultrasound, but then we bring the legs back down and we do the simulation based on CT, and then we have to rely on CT to adjust those needles and, and make sure that the, the implant is done properly. Um, so we moved on to ultrasound, and uh, you know, with ultrasound we have one an improved workflow. Uh, we implant and treat in the same position in the extended lithotomy position, um, and we also have it, it does not require a lot of resources. We use existing departmental resource. We can do everything in one room in one shot. It, it doesn't take long, uh, but there are some challenges there too. Uh, we still have uncertainty in the prostate gland delineation, especially after needle or catheter insertion and artifacts and bleeding. Uh, we do not have a good visualization of DILs and ECE, and we also have uh, very often very poor visualization of other structures, neurovascular bundles, bladder neck, um, and, and you know, uh, other uh, structures around the prostate. Uh, and so, uh, this really is the case uh, to use MRI. Uh, we have excellent visual visualization of the patient's anatomy, uh, the prostate, the ILs, ECE, the neurovascular bundles, uh, and that really opens the door 
to uh, potentially reduce toxicity uh, and improve our targeting, uh, introduce focal therapy, um, dose escalation to DILs, uh, treat patients uh, uh, with uh, salvage brachytherapy more reliably. But there are things we need to consider. What are our departmental resources? What kind of workflow can and do we want uh, to implement? Uh, and how do we want to uh, implant our patients? Is this going to be based on ultrasound or are we going to use MR guidance in the supine position? Uh, if we are considering multiple fractions for these patients, uh, how are we going to do the treatment purification? Should we do single insertion with multiple fractions or should we go to a workflow that uh, has uh, multiple insur insertions uh, a week or two apart? Um, and this is an old paper uh, that just, uh, you know, it shows uh, the differences between the three modalities, ultrasound, CT, and MRI. Uh, and uh, although this uh, paper describes uh, uh, LDR implant, uh, the same is true for HDR. The same is valid and the same type of artifacts may be seen uh, with metallic titanium needles uh, with, uh, if markers are implanted. Um, and you know, the visualization of anatomy, the uh, seminal vesicles, uh, the rectal wall, the prostate itself, even the external urinary sphincter are all very nicely seen on MRI. Uh, so where does one start? I think the best place to start is really uh, look at uh, some of the review articles. There's a nice a uh, review article in uh, the brachytherapy special issue on MRI uh, two year, uh, three years ago now uh, uh, about a, uh, a magnetic resonance implementation for uh, prostate brachytherapy. Um, there are also, uh, and I, I'm quoting GYN uh, papers here, uh, recommendations of uh, Jack Astro, uh, because some of what they uh, discuss, uh, the reconstruction of needles and reconstruction of uh, the 3D reconstruction of implants, applies to prostate brachytherapy just as it does to interstitial GYN. And there is upcoming PG-303 that uh, Jackie spoke at length about, uh, but this is in gray because it's not, it's still under review, it's upcoming. Um, before you start, the first thing to consider is, of course, MR safety. Um, there are MR questionnaires that need to be uh, uh, filled before the procedure, uh, physical and uh, secondary questionnaires uh, right before the procedure, uh, and in our workflow, we also do uh, physical screening. We want the patient several times during the procedure, and I'll show that later on. We move the patient from our brachy suite to the MRI, and that requires that we make sure that nothing that is foreign, uh, no metallic objects are brought, brought into the MRI suite. Um, we want to make sure that only MR safe and properly validated and tested applicators, um, immobilization devices are brought uh, into the uh, MRI. I'm not gonna speak too much about it because Jackie spoke about this already. Uh, and we also uh, want to make sure that uh, make sure that the patient is positioned properly within the MRI scan. Uh, for example, skin-to-skin -skin contact may create loops and heating and uh, discomfort and uh, injury to the patient. We want to make sure that the patient does not touch, touch the bore of the scan also because of heating and injury to the patient. Uh, be mindful of ancillary equipment requirements. So if you consider doing uh, a, a procedure under anesthesia, anesthesia monitoring system has to be placed outside a certain Gauss line, and that may vary with the uh, machine that you're using uh, in the MRI. Uh, and same thing for the HDR afterloader. If you have your MRI and HDR in the same room, you need to make sure that the afterloader is far enough from the magnet that it operates uh, correctly, and that make sure that it's all compliant with the ISUs of both the afterloader and uh, the uh, MRI. There are several references, and this is really the Bible. Uh, Sherlock uh, uh, 
has screening guidelines for uh, for patients. Uh, there's the standard for medical devices uh, in the Journal of Magnetic Resonance Imaging, and there's also extensive information uh, by the ASTM on how to test and what to do with your applicators. Um, this is a it's a lot of work. That trying to test your applicators on your own is a tremendous job. I do not recommend you do it on your own. But if you absolutely have to because you have something that you have made in-house or something that you absolutely need to use, then these are good references to have. Um, whatever you do, always consult your hospital MRI safety committee and officer. Uh, there are great resources, and it's really safety first. Um, we have still, we've been doing MRI for many years, and we still have uh, things happening. We have patients who forgot to tell us about an implant they had three days before procedure. So this is really having all the safety and questionnaires and uh, screening, uh, testing in place is very, very important. Um, Jackie also spoke about the choice of workflow. Uh, this may largely uh, be uh, decided by your resources about what you have available, whether you have an MRI in the department, whether you have to share MRI uh, with diagnostic with a radiology department, uh, or whether you have an MRI that is available for your procedures in your brachytherapy suite. Um, I will talk largely about uh, the MRI-based planning uh, because this is probably uh, what most people are going to have going forward. Uh, we have mostly done MR-informed brachytherapy until now, both for GYN and for prostate. Um, we have uh, done our pre-implant diagnostic CTs, and we used uh, all kinds of deformable models uh, to try to figure out where the DILs are within the prostate, try to dose escalate the DILs to those structures. Um, but we're, as we're moving uh, uh, to uh, more MR-based external beam uh, treatments uh, and MR LINACs are coming into radiation oncology departments, I think that this uh, uh, MR-based planning will become more and more prevalent in many of our departments. MRI-guided implants, where you actually do uh, your implants under MR, CNA, and M live MRI imaging, um, adjusting your needles and uh, looking for optimal placement, uh, is a luxury that even uh, places like us in Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, do not have. We do have an MRI in the department, and I think this is probably what most places are going to have. Uh, so. Uh, there, these are uh, two uh, examples. Uh, the uh, picture on, on, the right, uh, on the right is uh, from a, uh, a paper on a focal MRI uh, salvage uh, for uh, prostate brachytherapy. But I'm showing that picture here because you see the patient under anesthesia and you see the patient uh, with the HDR here. You need to make sure that everything is properly tied down, that everything is far enough from the uh, MRI. Uh, the picture on the left shows our department. We have an MRI suite uh, uh, on one side of the hall, and all the way down uh, behind that uh, computer cart is the entrance to our brachytherapy suite. And so what we have to do is we have to implant the patient in the brachytherapy suite. Uh, one, the patient, before we take them out of the OR, wheel them down the hallway under anesthesia, and bring them into the MRI suite for the scanning, complete the scan, and bring them back into our uh, brachytherapy suite uh, for, um, uh, to complete the treatment, either uh, reverse anesthesia and wake them up or do, uh, do the planning and treat under anesthesia, depending on uh, the procedure that we do. Uh, so this, this transfer alone, in our experience, adds at least an hour now uh, to the uh, to, to the procedure, uh, not counting for the, uh, uh, any adjustments and the MRI scanning and anything else that needs to be done in the MR simulation itself. Uh, this is not, uh, experience is not unique to us. Um, there's a nice paper that shows the learning curve of, uh, uh, associated with HDR prostate. 
Uh, and this uh, paper described a, a prostate procedure that was, uh, two, uh, was split into two uh, implants. And so the HDRBT1 and HDRBT2 are two implants that we're giving a week or two apart uh, to these patients. And you can see that as the, uh, the, uh, their experience uh, uh, as they became more proficient in their procedures, uh, the time went down. But I have to say that even with our experience at, a, uh, at an academic center, with all the resources, we still also uh, see that our procedures, if done intraoperatively, the entire time to completion of procedure is over four hours. Uh, they, we just are unable to get this done. And this is really uh, in competition with other uh, treatment modality with uh, when you, if you have a lot of patients in the department and you're doing ultrasound, it is really tough to convince everybody to go from a two hour procedure to a, a five hour procedure uh, for your patients. Um, so you really have to justify this and make sure that you select the patient and you select the procedures uh, that you're doing uh, accordingly. Um, the other thing you need to think about is the choice of applicators. Uh, plastic uh, catheters are uh, preferable because they result in uh, less artifacts. Uh, you can see the blooming effect uh, associated with titanium needles. Uh, and if you're not careful with your scanning and uh, if you have a lot of needles in the prostate, you can also see that it actually affects the quality of the imaging and you lose the detail in the MRI. Uh, so this is something that you have to be very careful with. Um, with uh, plastic needles, uh, unlike CT, it, just be aware that, uh, you know, plastic and air both look black on MRI. So if you have a uh, four millimeter tip, uh, you need to uh, be aware of it and subtract it when you're doing your, uh, your treatment planning. Finally, when you optimize your treatment, it's not just about visualizing the needles. If you're, patient, if you're implanting fiducial markers, for example, because your patient is going to go for uh, external beam and, or SVRT afterwards, you want to make sure that you can visualize those fiducial markers as well. Um, and again, this is the, uh, the same paper that Jackie mentioned. They also look at the reconstruction of needles uh, for uh, brachytherapy. And the same thing they did here uh, with a phantom in agarose gel, where you see the blooming uh, effect uh, in, in MRI uh, corresponding to the tip of the, uh, of the needle on CT. Uh, you, you see the same, uh, we have the same thing with, with prostate, and you see the same type of degradation that Jackie mentioned for GYN. You see that and you see the need for tweaking and improving your uh, sequences uh, on MRI after you have, uh, you have actually tested and, uh, uh, your, uh, your needles and applicators up front. Uh, this is an example of the uh, sequences that we use here. We use here for our uh, prostate HDRs. These sequences are vendor specific. They're uh, uh, specific to each uh, MRI model. And uh, you should really consult your vendor and your MRI physicist if you want to use something similar. They typically have uh, tables and charts that allow you to translate your sequences from one vendor to the other. Uh, so you don't have to repeat the whole optimization uh, exercise. Also be aware that they, like Jackie mentioned, they have a lot of uh, 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 algorithm to improve your image quality, to increase the, uh, uh, reduce the metal artifacts and reduce some of the blooming effect that you see with your applicators. You also want to think about patient immobilization. And really, you know, it can uh, be uh, simple. Uh, uh, immobilization, as you have here with the Schlesinger board. board we have a similar leg ramp that we uh, made uh, in-house that, uh, that operates very in a similar way to this. Uh, you can have uh, more elaborate devices like the Zephyr HDR platform that allows you to hover the patient from one 
uh, bed to the other for one, uh, uh, from, let's say from your MRI table to your stretcher uh, and wheel them into your treatment rooms without uh, having to change the patient position. Uh, be aware, however, that uh, to fit into the bore, uh, the patient will have to be in the lithotomy position, uh, a supine position as opposed to the lithotomy position. So you, the legs would have to be done. You have to make sure that the patient fits in the bore properly. Uh, another thing that we found, uh, uh, and that was really our experience, and there's really not a lot of publication on this, is that uh, we found that the, our MR images degraded the further the patient was uh, from the coil in, uh, in the table. Um, and uh, to reduce that, we decided to actually go with a native uh, uh, MR table, the curved MR table, so the patient is laying all the way down uh, uh, on, on the stretcher, uh, and we, then uh, we use the trolley, as shown here, uh, to wheel the patient out into the treatment room without having to move the patient. Uh, other vendors have other solutions, like the Siemens dockable table, the Sim dockable table below. Uh, there are other solutions out there. These are just examples. Um, and, uh, but all of them, whatever you do, they have to be tested and make sure that everything is MR safe. For example, uh, for the Zephyr table, there are elements, uh, uh, accessories to the table that cannot be in close proximity to the magnet or may not be in the room at all. So you really have to be careful what you bring into the MRI uh, and, and what you, know, you leave out. Um, the other uh, consideration is what do you do when you have uh, multiple fractions for these patients? And this is a, an old paper from 2003, um, and they did this based on uh, CT, and they sh showed, uh, and, and this is no different from MRI, the same things that we have learned in CT and the same uncertainties in uh, uh, catheter and gland uh, movement are valid when you do uh, interstitial implant uh, with MRI. And you will see the same type of motion and the same type of uh, the, the dosimetry uh, degradation uh, with, uh, with, with catheter motion. And so what we have done uh, in our clinic is uh, implement a workflow that uses a combination of uh, CT and fluoroscopy, and this was really dictated uh, by what we have in our department. We have a C-arm in our treatment room, um, and so what we found uh, is that most uh, catheter displacements occur uh, when anesthesia is reversed. And so immediate uh, after anesthesia is reversed and before the uh, uh, subsequent treatment is delivered, uh, we bring the patient into our CT scanner. Uh, we do a CT scan and we actually register the CT with a planning MRI. And uh, here you see uh, in uh, panel D is a blended image of the CT and MRI. And we make sure that the distance from the needle tips to implanted fiducials that serve as a surrogate for the target uh, are the same. Once we have established that no movement has occurred, we feel safe bringing the patient into our treatment room and continuing with treatment and m confirming those distances based on x-ray. Um, this is not foolproof. Uh, last week we had a GYN patient where we saw a needle uh, shift of uh, 1 cm. Uh, so, you know, this is something that really needs to be uh, considered, and this is something that uh, will require intervention and correction of the implant. And it may, you know, for prostate patients, well, for GYN patients, we often do multiple fractions with one insertion. For prostate patients, there may be a, uh, an argument to foregoing this workflow and doing two insertions uh, a week or two apart. So, uh, to uh, conclude, I really want to, uh, I hope that I impressed upon you that uh, MR is uh, an elegant tool for HDR 
prostate brachytherapy. It, it provides superior imaging and opens the door to targeted focal and pelvis brachytherapy. Uh, it is a fast evolving uh, treatment option. Uh, there are several trials ongoing, and uh, I, I, you know this is uh, something that we need to look out for and see how, uh, uh, in, in what ways we can take advantage of this imaging modality and how we can further escalate the dose and reduce toxicity for these patients. However, with all the nice advantages of MRI brachytherapy, it requires careful implementation of the imaging, QA, safety measures uh, uh, to have a successful program. Uh, facility limitations and workflow considerations are still a common barrier to wide use of MRI and brachytherapy. At least this was our experience. And with this, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gail. Great uh, presentation. Actually, we had a, a one question that came in, but that you did answer it about your uh, if you are fusing to ultrasound or CT, and it seems like you are doing the fusion with CT. Have you tried to do it with ult your ultrasound, or is there a problem um, with that? We have not tried to do. Uh, well, I take it back. When we first uh, started using MRI. Uh, uh, way back uh, when uh, MR spectroscopy was still in fashion, uh, we did uh, uh, our MRIs were done with a rectal balloon with a rectal probe, uh, and uh, we felt that uh, using the rectal probe and using the prostate uh, between MRI and ultrasound, uh, switching uh, simply switching from the um, uh, MR. Uh, probe to the ultrasound probe uh, would be the easiest and most reliable way to do so. We have not done so otherwise. We uh, we try to do this, um, and it, it, it is difficult. It is not always very reliable in our experience. There are other investigators that have done this successfully and uh, done this routinely. Uh, for example, the group in Canada in Sunnybrook have been doing this uh, for many years. Uh, it, it has not always been successful in our experience. What we did try to do, and again, uh, it's a double-edged sword, uh, is place a fiducial marker in the DIL uh, and make sure that you know you use that to guide uh, your contouring and guide your dose escalation. Um, but you know, if you want to look at, uh, especially if you have a 3T MRI, one of the reasons to get a 3T MRI is to be able to uh, get better imaging and be able to uh, watch and, uh, patient uh, outcomes uh, and, and tumor resolution. Uh, if you start placing uh, markers inside your DILs, you're destroying your images and it's, you know, you're defeating the purpose. So you, you really have to think about all aspects of the procedure and, and how, how, how to do this best. Great, thank you. Is there any other questions uh, from the attendees? I don't, I don't know, Melissa, I don't see it uh, in the chat box. I think we had the Q&A the Q box since I think we've, seen, uh, we've answered those. Uh, just one quick question to actually Jackie, I have. Did you mention, have you used the solid applicator model? Say you're doing a tandem ring interstitial and uh, would that help you? If, because you're doing MR only uh, I assume um, also you are doing um, any MR markers in your channels. Can you comment on that? Uh, sure. Yeah, I can comment on it. So we have not used the solid applicators that are available in the treatment planning system. I know that other facilities have, like we have a satellite facility that uses that for CT-based planning. Uh, we've just never gone that route. We've always just digitize the tandem and the ovoids separately. Um, because we have titanium applicators in our clinic, markers are of no use to us. Um, you just see the, the void, the signal void, basically. And that's what we use to um, digitize. Aha, yeah. uh -huh, that's why. Yeah, see, I was wondering. I, I use plastic applicators, so I would, the uh, solid applicators, 
are, in my experience, I could anchor them fairly well to get me where that channel. The most important thing, as you know, is the first wall position. So you have an accuracy, hopefully within a millimeter to really get that. And so, and do I uh, use the, uh, I sometimes do, I mean, I do have the uh, saline field channel. Those are the MR specific markers in the applicators. I, I use the Electa applicator. So um, just everybody, as you see, has slightly different, but the idea is that it's to learn what you've got on your applicators, definitely. And um, uh, try to use, uh, optimize your time. Any minutes saved, I think it's a, it's a plus for your program. Um, I wish we could have a contest to see who, who could get their planning reduced even within a minute or two. So it would be good to, uh, to learn. And uh, we, we spoke a lot about that. I think someone made a comment in the, it says the on central applicator library model can make GYN applicator reconstruction quite robust. Um, yeah, I think Lisa Glass men mentioned that. And um, we agree that, at least I agree in my uh, experience that helps not just for CT, but also MRI on T2. I could see it fairly well. I'm, I'm fairly confident I could uh, anchor that. So um, that's, that's a great, uh, uh, one there. thing that we do, one thing that we do for our tandem and ring, we also have a titanium applicator, um, and it's 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 hard to see. And one of the things that we uh, started to do is place gel inside the caps, uh, and that lights up and it tells you where the beginning of the ring is. Yeah, yeah. I had a tandem and ring plan suddenly thrown at me one day by our physician. It was on MRI. And uh, no, it wasn't suddenly thrown at me. I was given at least a day's notice, but I did take a <laughs> CT. I took a CT of the applicator ahead of time and I digitized it. And I saved that as an applicator so that I could line it up with the ring, you know, the, the, the tandem and the ring, because telling the starting point of the ring is hard when it's in this black cap. Um, but that might have been before solid models were even available. It was a long time ago, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely uh, use the solid applicators for those who are starting as a, it helps you a lot with uh, establishing that registration. And I agree with what Jackie said, the first 10 patients, we did the CTs along, we did scan the patient between MR and CT and actually that gave us also that uh, assurances about how much movement my app, the applicator, it's certainly obviously physicians, the way they do packing is, is uh, quite influencing that uh, uncertainty of your position before you treat. So uh, that was a nice part of the commissioning is to really uh, get your MR uh, in parallel with your CT to transition. And once we did that, we feel very comfortable about the program. Um, so so it's uh, important teamwork and uh, examine your workflow. And when you, I think initially it's about all about resources, try to understand what the going to provide you, uh, and not just for the initial, it's for the longevity of the program. Uh, I've launched a program three years now uh, at a very, uh, a cancer center where I practice, where it's, uh, we don't have dedicated MRI, but we were able to find a workflow where anesthesia, MR, uh, radiologists, and technicians have worked with us to examine where we do every minute of along the step. And as we transport the patient, we're actually planning. So the physicist is actually now waiting for the, uh, the patient to come back to the vault or the physician uh, either. They, we all have uh, learned how to do a, a workflow that's overlapped. So, so, so think about that will be, will be great. And I think, um, I think this is uh, no other questions. I think we have, uh, uh, Melissa have sent you the link to your Sam um, credits, please uh, use those. Um, and um, um, any other comments, uh, um, Jackie or Gil? Um, no, I, I agree with everything you said. Uh, it's all about workflow and, and what your institution can accommodate. So it's, it's gonna be very tailored to your institution. We can give a lot of advice, a lot of thoughts, but in the end, it's, it's going to be what, what you can accomplish. 
Great. All right. Well, thank you all. We went a little over time, but we, we've accomplished, I hope, um, and you guys have our contact if you have further questions about uh, your programs and please uh, feel free to reach out to the speakers. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.